Welcome to Meaningful Conversations with Dr. L. This is a Savage Bull Entertainment production. I'm such a huge fan these days of old music that makes us feel good and that takes us to higher ground, that elevates our thinking. Hello, beautiful people. I forgot to say that. I am like on cloud nine nine. because we have back with us someone that I am calling my brother in Christ. Um, I'm told to. um, Okay, I'm trying to get myself together. My brother in Christ, Rob Shank, is back with us. Yay! (laughs) So hello, beautiful people. Welcome back to another edition of Meaningful Conversations. We had such an amazing time last time and we were just getting going good so Rob thank you so much for agreeing to be back with us tonight my pleasure and my dear reverend doctor I will tell you I love your repertoire (laughs) Redbone was one of my favorite (laughs) bands from the 1970s and you just played come and get your love yes and what I think was so wonderful about I mean just the musical genius yeah uh, I think it was a band of brothers. Yeah, they they were, they were uh, related, and um, and they were Native American yeah. and broke through in the popular music scene. And I remember it well. And I have that song on my phone. Are you so serious? It's you. on your playlist. See, this is destiny. This is, is this is more than this is divine connection, divine you know intervention that brought us together here. So I am so excited. Let me just tell people quickly who are joining us for the first time because we do have some people. I sent this out on a, another an old list that I had. Uh, so I want to welcome everyone who received the invite via email. I hadn't sent an invite out in a long time via email, but I got so many great responses of this list of like six or 700 people. So, um, so we've got some new followers tonight who are tuning in for the very first time to Meaningful Conversations. I want to welcome you and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then our loyal fans, you know, we are building something great here with Meaningful Conversations. We just started this program in March. I was approached, asked to do this on behalf of Savage Bull Entertainment. My husband and another friend started. People know my husband's background, traveled with, um, you know, Eric B. and Rakim and LL Cool J and all of them back in the day. And um, so just an amazing group of people that he hang around with, cool people. But anyway, so um, they were not aware that I was even doing this. So I am just so thrilled that the first show they get introduced to a Meaningful Conversations have um, has you as a guest. So let me tell people a little bit about who you are. And I do think on your website, that description of you, a public theologian for today is so on point. I am um, just so excited that I was blessed enough to come across your path and to begin to be a follower of yours quite a a while back, reading some of your writings, Got Costly Grace, made my way through that. And and, um, it's on Kindle and my Kindle is acting up. So I hope I'll be able to uh, get it going because I highlighted a few things I did want us to delve into tonight. And if you have not gotten this book, please, please, please order Costly Grace today. You can go to Rob Shank, R-O-B-S-C-H-E-N-C-K dot com, Reverend Rob Shank's website and get it. But let me tell you a little bit about who he is. Remind people. Um, I know if you tuned in last week, there's no way you could have forgotten um, because he made that kind of impression. Uh, it, a positive transformational change is at the heart of his life's work and his life. As you follow his story, you'll learn about um, his conversions. You'll find out about that in the book. 
Rob is a, um, a a husband. He is he is a reverend. He is someone who um, really has made a huge transformation in discovering and settling in a place that is very familiar to me. And that is growing up, you know, in the church, growing up, um, learning from a very conservative, evangelical, um, Pentecostal upbringing, um, which he converted to, by the way. Uh, And there's quite a story in there about he and his brother's conversion uh, in the book. But, um, you know, Jewish father. And, uh, you know, so he imagine this as a teenager coming home and saying, I'm going to convert to or I have converted to um, Christianity. But he he played at in one stage of his life, one season of his life, a critical role in shaping and influencing evangelical political thinking. Um, He was avid anti-abortion, um, which I translate in many instances as anti-women's rights because I come from that orientation. But he's brought me to a place through his readings and I mean, through his writings to a place that 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 just feels right for me right now. And and extending grace also to people and understanding that, you know, we can't put people in these boxes um, in such polarized way. Either you're if you're for this, then you're for, against everything else. But that's not what I wanted to say to introduce him. Um, he also, so he at one point, you know, was someone that I would have been standing on the other side, protesting um, the opposite point of view. And that's, you know, he was on the anti-abortion, um, uh, you know, working to dismantle Roe v. Wade. Um, I was on the other side, working hard with my other human rights and civil rights and women rights activists to protect women's rights and to protect uh, Roe v. Wade. Um, You know, he he was really in that circle uh, that we look at today in in terms of, you know, Republicans and far right evangelicals who were making decisions that were antithetical, I think, to uh, to Jesus's core values and teachings. And so his book is amazing because he takes us through these three conversions in his life that I think if we, you know, sit down and we meditate on God's word, but we also meditate on this book, we will find it com- extraordinarily compelling. Uh, he is a husband and an author, a public speaker, and he's accessible. He responded right away. So I want to get into our conversation. Oh, before I do that, I know I feel scattered all over the place because I rushed in here from another panel on um, COVID-19 vaccines that was sponsored by um, the Down East Coal Ash Environmental Social Justice Coalition. I was invited there by a good friend of mine that I went to jail with um, in exercising civil disobedience, Bobby Jones. So thank you all. If you all jump from that to this, thank you all for that invitation. Sorry we ran out of time. Looking forward to coming back and continuing that really important discussion about getting um, the vaccine and, and um, hearing from people who still remain hesitant. So, Rob, let's do this. Let's do this. So I want to pick up a little bit where we left off. And it's this whole you wrote this article that I read through and I'm not going to read through it again. But um, you you stated that white American evangelicals are the new uh, snake handlers, only more dangerous. I want to pull that out a little bit. I want to sort of um, sort of talk about Trump and this Trump, what I call Trump theology. <laughs> and tell us really in a sum up, what's, what's the core, what are the core principles that, that, that are guiding a lot of evangelicals in their support for Trump? Let's, let's loop back there and start from there as we pull this out. What, what is it? It's, 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 you know, what is it that makes him so fascinating to pe- to the evangelicals? Well, I think a few things at the core, and it may be different for different people. 
I think there is a strong stream of resentment. You know, white evangelicals very wrongly have uh, a, a memory, a, a, a false memory of persecution and marginalization. Now, it is true, if you look at the history of evangelicalism, and I'm going back 300 years to the preaching of the Wesley brothers, John and Charles Wesley, mm -hmm. out of Britain, had a big impact here uh, in the United States. Methodism, which they founded, would rise to become the preeminent uh, church of the 1800s, the 19th century. And they did preach to the underclass. They, they preached to the poor, to the coal miners, to immigrants, um, to marginalized people. And so maybe in the very, very distant memory, there is this idea that we were the poor folks you know, from across the tracks, mm. that we had the uneducated clergy, we had the very poor congregations, our preachers way in the distant past mm -hmm. had to work a second job because the congregation couldn't support them and on and on it goes. But a big change came as long ago as the late 19th century, the late 1800s. Mm. Mm -hmm. When suddenly, for example, Teddy Roosevelt decided he had to become an evangelical in order to win the presidency. So he switched churches. Mm. This We're talking about the late 1800s. Right, right. So, you know, it's that long ago. And today, you drive into any town, any city, more than likely the biggest, wealthiest and most politically influential church in that town or city will be a white evangelical church. That's true. It will be the big Baptist church. Yep. It will be the big Bible church. It yep. will be uh, the big Assemblies of God congregation or the Church of God, and on and on it goes. So this is a false perception, but Trump played on this mm -hmm. and said, I know you're the the people everybody hates, the snooty, educated New Englanders from Yale and Harvard, they look down their noses on you. Well, those days are over. Mm. I'm going to be your champion. And this appeal to people's pride. Mm -hmm. um, I had one national white evangelical leader who at the Republican convention, I was there. Yes. Yeah. And I was sitting in a, a room with Trump's representatives and I leaned over and I said to him, there is no way we can support this man. He's a charlatan. Mm -hmm. He's a fake. Yeah. He appeals to the worst in us. And, he, and this guy leaned back over to me. Now he was one of the most influential run for president himself. Mm. And he leaned over and he said, who else is going to get this done? We need somebody who can slam wow. the liberals. Wow. Well, that, as you were saying, that that contradicts the whole message of Christianity. That's right. That's right. And 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 what astounds me is how, you know, I mean, even when he got up and he said Chronicles, uh, uh, Chronicles two or something, when he misquoted, um, you know. Uh, not his mishandling of what is to us Christians the sacred text, even and when he pulled held up the Bible when he walked across the street during the Black Lives Matter protest, you could tell some of us could tell that he was doing exactly what you said. He was playing. He was manipulating people who ought to know better. So my my question to you, Rob, since you know these people <laughs> well, is um, do they know better and they're just doing it anyway? And 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 and, you know, so do they not feel like 
that in some way this isn't pleasing God to follow this charlatan, this this person who is in a lot of ways in my mind is making a mockery out of Christianity and Christians and Christian leadership. Do they not get that? And do they not get that or do they get it? But something else is more important to them. And if that's the case, what is that something else that's more important to them? I'm very saddened to tell you that I think the top tier, the leadership level, these are the heads of multi-million, sometimes multi-hundred million dollar organizations, people who fly to their vacation homes on a Gulfstream jet at $8,000 an hour mm -hmm. in operational costs. They know. Right. They know. Now, that isn't to say that they aren't, they don't have some of those same, what I call wicked impulses, mm -hmm. um, but they know they have them. And Donald Trump gave them permission to unleash it. Mm -hmm. Now, the people underneath, and keep in mind, some of these big white evangelical organizations have as many as a million or two million people on their mailing lists. Wow. wow. They will trade tens of millions of names a year, swapping them with each other, renting names from each other and so forth to, mm. to send out, you know, email and, and paper mail. A lot of times it's paper mail. And my dear sister, mm. I feel safe with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> may mm -hmm. I, yes. may I make my confession? Yes. Yeah. And I'm ashamed to say this, and I think some of your listeners will rightfully uh, hate me for it. And, and I understand no. the feelings. No hate. No, just. Okay. Well, maybe at least be profoundly disappointed to, mm -hmm. to worse, because this is what I'm going to tell you. For 20 years, mm -hmm. I signed upwards of 3 million letters a year that went out to people. And, and this is what my fundraisers, the people who ran this mailing operation and all of the organizations have them. Mm. Big, huge corporate enterprises that mm. run these fundraising uh, programs and raise upwards of a billion dollars a year for mm. all of these different mm. organizations. And what they would tell me at a table, and I fought them for a while, I resisted them. They would say, I need more fear and more anger out of you. I got to make your people terrified. Mm. If they're afraid, they're going to send you a lot more money than mm. if they're not afraid. So we're going to make them afraid. I need things from you that make your people scared to death. I, I remember one saying, if, if if you don't know how to make them afraid, I do. Mm. And I will make them afraid. Wow. Now, what that means is you create fictional characters. For example, I knew Nancy Pelosi when I was working on Capitol Hill. I knew the current Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, as a doting grandma who loved her grandchildren. Mm. I remember on Martin Luther King Jr. Day, in the Capitol, I was there. She knew I was her political opponent. I was, at, at, in those days, and again, I'm ashamed to say it, but I was an outspoken critic of hers, and yet she came right over to me. And she said, Reverend, you need to meet these good folks, mm. and took me right to MLK Jr., uh, MLK the third, uh, the son, mm -hmm. and then from there took me to John Lewis. Wow. Congressman John Lewis. And this is what she said to him. She said, John, this man opposes everything we stand for. Mm. But you know, we got to love him. Wow. And he said, well, that's just what I do. I love you. And he hugged me. Wow. And I'm telling you, when you get a yeah. deep hug, you've probably been hugged by that man. You never forget it. Yep. It was so changing for me. Yeah. And I'll never forget it. But my fundraisers made 
Nancy Pelosi into Cruella DeVille. Mm. And that's what they called her. They said, we're making her into Cruella DeVille. She's mm. going to be the nastiest, most miserable, horrible thing you've ever read about in our letters because people have got to hate her. The more they hate, the more likely they're going to send money. Mm. Well, I resisted. I fought them for a long time. Eventually, they pulled contract. They said, we have the last word on editorial content. Mm -hmm. You either play ball or we sue each other. Right. I right. gave in. I'm sorry to say that I was a coward. I gave in. We did that. We created this fear. And 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 here's where it gets a little worse. Do I dare keep talking here? Yes, please. Here's where it gets worse. One of those fundraisers sat at the table one day in a conference room and said to a bunch of us sitting around the table. He said, "Let me tell you about Helen." Helen's 69 years old, lives on a rural route in Kansas. Her nearest neighbor is three miles away. She's totally alone. The biggest event in her day is the delivery of the mail. Mm. And I want her to find a letter from you that's 13 pages long and makes her so scared mm. and so angry about the world that her grandchild will inhabit that she will send you the last hundred dollars she has. Wow. That's what my job is. Mm. So what's happened when you think I send out 3 million pieces of mail a year, there are organizations that send out a hundred million pieces mm -hmm. of mail a year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You go to some of these organizations and the U.S. Post Office has actually set up a warehouse operation inside their buildings mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. manage the amount of mail they send out. In other words, this is toxic. It's poisonous. It is sent out all over the country. And people like that imaginary 69-year-old woman, grandma, grandpa, read this stuff. And they believe that Democrats, people like, uh, you know, back in the day, mm -hmm. uh, everybody vilified uh, any national black leader. Right, Dr. And King. especially <laughs> it was consummated with Barack Obama. Oh, yeah. The, I remember some of my colleagues who were saying to me, this secret Muslim is going to bring Al Qaeda into this country to wipe out Christians. Now, did they believe this? That's what I'm. I'm. I'm trying to figure out. Are they puppeteers and, um, you know, chicanery is their skill, and they work it to get money or and to stay in power, or do they really believe some of the stuff that they're peddling? Like, do, did they really believe that he was this whole Bertha thing? Did they really believe that? And then I also, Rob, since we are, you know, it's just us <laughs> and some listeners. It is just us. It's us and some listeners. Um, yeah, um, did they and the radio, uh, Steve will have to tell me. So we get quite a few listeners on the radio, a lot more than on, um, you know, when we stream. But um, so. Uh, did, uh, tell me, did they really believe that thing, the things that they were peddling, the fear that they were, fear tactics that they were using was a tactic, right? So I get that. But the messaging behind some of the fear tactics that they were using, did they really believe that? And then I also want to ask you, be honest, what do they think about black people? Are the leaders that the Tim Scotts, the Candace Owens and the others, do they, I forget the pastor name out of Ohio that was a loyal Trump supporter and advocate. Do what, what, what do they feel about in general? And I'm not saying this for every single one of them, but what's the, what, what are they really saying behind closed doors about black leaders and even those that are in the faith? Well, this is where, where I had really rude awakenings because as you alluded to earlier, you know, I was raised in a very liberal family, very progressive liberal family. In fact, 
my father was a big supporter of the NAACP. He did fundraisers for them in New York City, even as a very young man. My mother befriended, she grew up in a very mid-Atlantic um, upper class family that had help, you know, they had mm -hmm. uh, household help as they called uh, folks back mm -hmm. then. And they were virtually always, always black. And she befriended the daughter of the housekeeper, which was a real no-no mm -hmm. in her world. And she had to do that very surreptitiously. But this, this woman was a lifelong friend to my mother. They were, they were intimate uh, friends and confidants with each other. And my mother, when she lived in Florida, was pregnant with my oldest sister and uh, got on a bus, uh, was seated there, pregnant, uh, an elderly black woman uh, boarded the bus. She immediately got up and the bus driver rebuked my mother mm. and told her, you, you stay right where you are. This woman goes to the back. And my mother defied the, the uh, bus driver and said, no, she will sit here. Mm. And, 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 and she won that. But those were the kinds of people I was raised by. And so, you know, I... I All until you converted to Christianity. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying that jokingly, say, but I'm sister. serious. <laughs> it seems like it even in your book. Uh, oh and Lord. that's that was my terrible awakening yeah. and it was after i went to washington dc yeah and here i was with a lot of southern folk you know a lot of members of congress senators so on from the south and i do remember in one strategy meeting i said you know every time we do a news conference up here we have a phalanx of old white guys. Why do we do that? We need to bring women and we need to bring color in, into our presentations. Come on now. And one member of Congress said, why would we ever do that? <sighs> and I said, wow. well, because it's terribly important. It shows, you know, the, the whole picture of America. And he said, that ain't going to get us any numbers. Mm. That ain't going to buy us any points. So wow. some were just cynical like that. Mm -hmm. Others were racists. Yeah. Others were absolutely racist. Well, and did, I that... experienced it mm -hmm. even myself preaching in the South. I remember in one big church, uh, I was introduced as a Jew boy, mm. uh, wow. you know, to the congregation and, uh, and 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 one of the elders came up and said, I never met a Jew that didn't want to take my money. Wow. Oh my so, goodness. You know, I yeah. learned early on there's yeah. there isn't there isn't always a difference yeah. between North and South, but white evangelicalism today is dominated by a religion that emerged out of antebella or really postbellum, I guess, really after the Civil War. Yeah that came out of the South and the biggest white evangelical denomination in the country, the Southern Baptist Church was created to approve of, to sanction, to give, uh, you know, sacred status to the institution of slavery. Yeah. And this continues to, uh, to poison uh, the the move you know the, the the spiritual community that is white American evangelicalism, but it's a mix. It's a yeah. mix of cynicism and of racism. Yeah, and this whole hegemonic patriarchal you know patriarchy. Also, I want to I you know I believe one of the biggest talking about fear mongering, but there's also another tactic that they use the far right or the evangelical white have used and even um conservative white men in particular and women some of them you know uh, republican uh conservative have uh, is it, and this is making it seem to poor whites that they are their savior how does I, like I thought Trump was honestly going to fail. One, I knew he was a great 
uh, theatrical person, right? A great, you know, I'm not going to go as far as saying buffoon, but um, he, you know, uh, he was comical and he, um, he this this sort of good old boy, um, he reminded me, I grew up in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and it's an open, and UNC is an open campus, went there undergrad. So there were keg parties and frat fraternities. And um, so this good old drinking buddy kind of thing person that you know sit and you let them be as obnoxious because as they can't as as they as they want to be because it's funny sometimes and sometimes it's just them boys being boys with beer drinking beer and booze right um but after a while i thought surely everybody's going to see through it and especially people in the south who have this not disdain for northerners but distrust and who have always felt that northerners look down on southerners so i thought he's not going to get southerners that wrapped up in that that whole facade and dang on it it worked and and i think it it got me thinking a lot about one of the one of the longest most effective use tactics is making poor whites think that white affluent and back in the day it would have been landowners right because they were sharecroppers too like side with black folk but making them think that they they were their savior how did he do that I mean, I just, I don't, I'm, I don't get it. I really don't get how he has fooled so many. And I know we touched on it earlier, but it's still, there's just still something there that I'm like, he's an embarrassment. He's almost like, you know, the the drunk uncle who goes too far and you're like, okay, now, you know, we are not going to invite him next year because, you know, he's ruining it for everybody. When will, or do you think they'll ever get to that point? Well, you know, of course, uh, as you say, he, he, he's a very clever mm-hmm. entertainer. Mm-hmm. He can put his finger into the wind and tell which direction it's blowing. He, we saw this early on in his campaign rallies. Yeah. He literally uh, did a focus group with the 10,000 people that were in front of him. He would say, you like that? You like mm-hmm. that? Which do you like? You like this? You like that? Mm. He was actually writing the script uh, in front of our eyes. He was testing the reactions. Yeah. And, you know, that's what you do. That's what you do in the entertainment industry. You test your audience. What do they like? What don't they like? What do they respond to? You get focus groups. You get people that, you know, they... They do everything, including uh, measure heartbeat yeah. uh, and perspiration while mm-hmm. somebody's watching a show or a film. Yeah. And they see you know, what works, what doesn't work here. And here's another trait of um, white American evangelicalism. And that is we tend to be very celebrity driven. We mm-hmm. have our own celebrity preachers. Yeah. We have our celebrity artists, I mean, music artists. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have our celebrity television hosts and so forth. We're very celebrity driven. So now you get a big celebrity. Mm. And Donald Trump had made a name for himself as a celebrity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of people I know watched The Apprentice and loved it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think even got a vicarious um, satisfaction out of it because either they themselves feared being fired, were fired, or would like to fire somebody. Somebody, right? And And he played to that masterfully, just magnificently. And he had help. He had help uh, in the producers. He did. And, you know, I I just thought about, for some reason, that lady that you... um, uh, gave the case as an example of of receiving that letter the hundred dollar asking for the hundred dollars that lives out in the remote area on route whatever and whatever um you know many people uh, celebrities are their react is how they think they're staying connected with um 
it does something for them when they are out of when they're living in low density areas and they don't come in contact with a lot of people, soap operas, uh, televangelists, game shows and all of that. They consume a lot of TV. And so you're absolutely right. So the idea that we now have a celebrity who could be president and he's talking a language that sort of taps into stuff that I I've suppressed and couldn't really say um, is part of it. Um, I just, I just always, I, it made me cringe because not so much people, because nobody I knew was voting for him. Although I did know a few people whose wives, interestingly, um, white people I grew up with in Chapel Hill who, who are very, you know, still, I consider them as friends and their wives or spouses, whatever voted for him. Very affluent white people, um, who had a justification they wanted to try it and they believed in his economics politics but but anyway i would i would cringe really at the whites in especially when he would come to north carolina because i just felt like he was just he was making a mockery out of him he was you know in some covert way probably going back to his hotel laughing and like i can't believe they bought that let me try this the next time i can't believe they bought and the sad thing is it's so what he was doing was so dangerous and it still is hence january 6th uh, as an example, um, you know, so, so dangerous because he was evoking and stoking um, the, 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 the ugliest parts of humanity and of our, you know, nature um, and, and, and taking it as a joke, not understanding how far things could get, not understanding that you, can, it's not like a television show it, where you can say, okay, cut, that's it. That's a, that's a wrap. Um, we'll come back and do something tomorrow. Fun. No, when you start stoking racism and racist beliefs and all these things, pitting, pitting people against people, poor whites, um, you know, f afraid of Hispanics and Latin Latinos thinking they're coming in and they really are taking their jobs and even blacks buying into that. Um, and, 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 and blacks, you know, hating or, or fearing and, and arming themselves because they, they refuse to be, uh, even any, they refuse to be an example of the past where brothers were taken out of their homes and hung and so forth. And they're like, oh, heck no, this will not happen under my watch. And so people are arming up and ready to go to war, ready to fight a civil war. That's what would make me so angry with him because he was stoking things that he had no idea. Because I really do think that he is, he may be clever, but I don't think he's very um, wise or intelligent. I just don't. And I may be wrong. Some people say, no, he's really smart. I think there's a difference between being um you know, a master manipulator and smart. And so he worried you. me. He worried me because I, I just didn't think, I don't think he understands. He doesn't know the history. He probably hasn't really read. He only knows what he saw or heard or whatever. But I think he was so removed from Southern politics and, and, the, and the ethos of the South in particular and North. So am I wrong you know, on that I, or? Uh, yes, very much so. So much there that that was rich. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was rich, my dear doctor, um, and, and points to so many things here. I served my first church as an associate pastor in Queens, New York, where Donald Trump was raised. And Queens, like everywhere in the country, has a peculiar uh, subculture. Mm -hmm. It has a way of being. And the folks there are amazing. You know, when I went to New York City, I, I, I'm from uh, suburban Buffalo, New York, you know that from the book. Right. So when I went to New York City, I was going to the big city, to the city my father worked in uh, as a young man, and uh, lauded as a cosmopolitan center on earth. But Queens was so provincial, was such mm -hmm. a bubble mm -hmm. 
There were people who told me I've never left my neighborhood. Wow. I have a grocery store, a hospital, a school. I have everything I need here. I work in this neighborhood. I've never left my neighborhood. Mm. So these were people who lived in very narrow quarters and, you know, black and, and uh, brown people were far away mm. from those neighborhoods mm. in Queens and people like Donald Trump's father kept them away mm. Mm. by locking them out uh, of, uh, of the apartment complexes he was building uh, in Queens in those days. And we all know the story of that. We know right. that that uh, they were fined and yep. and uh, found uh, uh, guilty of violating civil rights. Right. Um, so they did this deliberately, and and he was, I think, at that time, the biggest real estate holder uh, in in Queens. Uh, that is uh, Trump's father, Fred Trump. Right. So all that simply to say, uh, Donald Trump knew nothing. Right. Of 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 the world outside his very white mm -hmm. uh, and very wealthy uh, bubble. Yeah. Let's, so yeah. but he learned quickly what people wanted to hear yes. and needed to hear. Yes. Oh, gosh. But I, I just want to. Uh, yeah, it, he did. He knew how to play on their fears, like you said. And um. He knew that at the time that he came on the scene that Republican supporters were searching for um, revenge. They were searching for a way to exact revenge on what they believed was an all out, um, you know, takeover of of democracy uh, and by someone that was never ever supposed to break through the institutional and structural barriers that were in place the systemic policies and practices and and um uh, people who amassed all, uh, most of the wealth to control the politics on both sides, the Democratic side and Democrats and Republican. P President Obama was not supposed to break through. And I think people were so frustrated on the right, on the far right, the ev evangelicals included, um, that they were looking to exact revenge. And, and, and if it meant setting the whole thing on fire with them in it, they were willing, I think, to do it because they felt probably that they knew the escape routes. If, if the house was on fire, they knew how to get it. But um, President Obama was not supposed, America in their eyes was, the institutions and the structures, systems were, that were in place were, they th thought, you know, solid and were, n and he was never supposed to break through. And I don't know if, honestly, I'm hoping we'll see that happen again in my lifetime, but I'm not sure because I do believe that this whole assault on voting rights um, and the stripping of voting rights um, th that is taking place now in this country and the way in which the Supreme Court is stacked, uh, I don't know. I don't know if we would see it again. Your people that you worked for in that space are are very, I think they're much smarter than, than Democrats. I really do, politically. And, and I have to say, um, I still stay in touch with those networks so that I can get inside information. Yeah. I don't mind telling you, I, I, I preserved my life membership in the Ring of Freedom NRA mm -hmm. uh, constituency so that I can get the information flow. Yeah. And one of the biggest motivators there, and, and I thought this was where you're going, maybe you were, is to keep Kamala Harris from becoming president of the United States. Absolutely, absolutely. And so they will actually violate the constitution, yep. both the federal constitution and plenty of state constitutions. Yep. They will, uh, 
disenfranchise large segments of the population and even their own people. Yes. Because remember that in this last election, you know, if you look at the demographics, uh, Democrats have got all the young people, right. Republicans have got a whole bunch of old people, right. and they're the people who vote by oh, mail. Right. Exactly. They will disenfranchise their own people. Like I said, it's a trap door. They're like, look, if we got to if we got to burn some of our folk on the inside, to, if we got to lock some of our people on the inside to keep Kamala and another Obama type person from getting out and getting into this space that is sacred, that is the, the chief uh, commander in chief of these United States, we will do it. And they are showing that they will do it and they are doing it so, so, so brazenly that, um, you know. And, and doing it with, and doing it with COVID as well. And doing it with COVID. And the By way, politicizing mm-hmm. COVID. Yep. And the way they can their make own money. Constituents. They're, they're killing, their, killing own their own constituents. That's right. That's exactly right, my brother. That's exactly right. My dear brother, this, this, we can go on. I do want to touch on um, for the next 13 minutes. See how time flies when I'm talking to you. <laughs> we all have, look, I hate to say, I'm not going to ask you to come back next Thursday. I know you're like, look, this is all you're going to get out of me right now. Um, but I am going to ask you back in the future, closer to, um, uh, you know, some elections are going on or will, will be going on. But um, I want to talk about Israel and Palestine. Do you mind having a, a little conversation about. Please. Israel and the fact that the United States, sometimes I think we turn a blind eye to, we give Israel a pass on things. Now, both, I I agree that there's, you know, some issues on both sides, Palestine and Israel, but talk me through, uh, it's almost like, you know, I do, the Holocaust was horrible. And I remember I could hardly make it through the Holocaust Museum. And it was a wrap for me when I got at the end because that's when they had the the shoes of the kids, the the display there. And I was in DC in, in uh, 94 through 98. And so, um, you know, I went to the Holocaust Museum by myself and I'm telling you, it just, it just tore me apart. So, I I stand with and in support of my Jewish friends and preserving and recognizing and honoring their history. I do think, however, we allow that to, um, I think we use that, we being the United States, and um, we give Israel passes on humanitarian issues that to me, we shouldn't, give them um and i think it's out of our fear of being too heavy-handed with israel um because of the whole jewish connection and the holocaust and how it would be perceived by very influential jewish leaders in the united states am i far off or what's going on with palestine and israel that was my no i think you're exactly right um And I have to say, probably the biggest offenders here are white evangelicals Mm. who will not criticize Israel under any conditions. Right. Because they're chosen people. Which is both naive. Right, right, right. It's naive. It's unjust. Um, You could argue that it's racist. Mm. because there's a definite opinion that the Palestinian people, not just because of their religion, because they're Muslim. Right. Incidentally, there are plenty of Palestinian Christians. We have to remember Bethlehem is in Palestine. That's right. And there's plenty of Palestinian Christians, including evangelicals. One of the largest populations of evangelicals mm. in the Middle East is in Palestine. Oh wow! I didn't. Know and that. they feel the oppression by the state of Israel as much as their Muslim neighbors do. Mm. And so, when you talk to evangelicals in Palestine, they have a very different opinion, very different, opposite opinion of mm. Israel than evangelicals in the United States do. 
and for good reason. Now, you know, if you look at Israel itself, it has a very vigorous democracy. There are progressives and liberals who are very critical of their own country's policies, and particularly when it comes to the Palestinian people. Yeah. But it doesn't play well here in terms of the, 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 the most powerful forces in this country, which right. include white evangelicals, includes, of course, the top level conservative Republicans. And you have Netanyahu, who was a, a Donald Trump before there was a Donald yes. Trump. Yes. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad you said that. I've always and said that he was a charlatan and a, uh, oh my goodness, thank you. Completely. Yes. Comple and, I've, and I've been with the guy. I've wow. been with the guy. I've been with Netanyahu. Oh my goodness. And even in the days when I dared not speak those words for the punishment I would have gotten for it, I knew this guy's a charlatan. Yeah. This guy is a fake. Yeah. This guy is playing us like a fiddle. I agree. Playing white evangelicals But I'm with like you. I dare and not say it because I know if I said it, if I posted anything on social media, I would have, I, I, and, I've, I, and I've said some things before and people were like, whoosh, they swarmed in and how could you? And, you know, I think you should apologize. And, um, you know, Dr. Laws is anti-Semitic and so forth. And I'm far from it. And everybody, you know, so I don't even defend myself on it because my, at my track record and all that, you know, who I am speaks for, for itself. So I, I rarely do I defend myself, but um, I've seen it. I've seen it happen. And sometimes I'm like, you know, forget it. Y'all need to know this. If we're going to stand for human humanitarian um, and civil rights and, um, you know, equality and justice for all, we need to be able to call out bad players. Um, we need to be able to call out, you know, uh, violent regimes, people who exploit uh, oppressive uh, regimes and leaders, no matter who they are. Um, so, so I'm so glad I, I've always said that and P Putin too, Putin is, 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 is a con artist, but I think there's something else going on with him. I think he's so ruthless. He's more to me like, um, what's the guy in North Korea? Um, Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-un, yes. Um, they are sinister to, now they are to the core, like hardcore gangster. <laughs> <laughs> That's the difference. Trump is no more gangster than and and Netanyahu maybe not. I don't know. After that last election, when you know, I'm like, I don't know. He, I'm beginning to wonder now. He's got some ways like Putin. I think Putin will do like he did, poison somebody, cut your head off, you know, make people disappear and all that. He's true gangster. Trump is just a wannabe. He's he's so weak in my opinion, but. He's got I, I got to tell you, I got to just tell you this story of being invited to the Israeli ambassador's residence here in Washington for a dinner one night. And he didn't know that I was a white evangelical minister, leader of a ministry at that time. He didn't know who I was. I was just at his table because I was on a list. So I'm sitting at the table and he's at the head of the table and he rips into mocking evangelicals. White. Now, this is Netanyahu's ambassador wow. who's sitting at the table and he starts saying, you know, you know, with these crazy uh, Bible evangelical people, you know, wow. we don't have to sell them anything. We don't have to make a case for anything. You know what we do? We go in, we throw a Bible on the floor. It opens up to pages and we say, God told us to do it. And they say, good, we'll support you. Wow. He's mocking us. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And I said, you know what? These guys are such operators. Mm -hmm. They're such actors. Mm -hmm. They are playing us. Yep, they and are. And this is reality. And this is where I know we only got five minutes. So if you don't mind me going off just for a second. Go right ahead. But, you know, I've. I told you before, I'm kind of in love with a dead German named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, yes. this young, brilliant, courageous pastor uh, who was, in case I didn't say enough last time, was inspired so much when he was here in New York, 1930, and he goes to uh, Abyssinian Baptist Church in mm -hmm. Harlem. Mm -hmm sits under the preaching of Adam Clayton Powell Jr. and, or excuse me, Adam Clayton Powell Sr. and has a conversion experience 
and in that setting learns about the suffering of, as he would later write, the Negro people mm -hmm. in the United States and translates that and says, we have the same racist problem in Germany. I'm going back home to suffer with my people. Mm -hmm. Put him on the road to martyrdom. He would be murdered, hanged at age 39. Uh, he was 39 too? Dr. King was 39. Exactly. Oh, wow. Exactly. Yes. And I've Christ often was of in his 30s, was 30. Yes. Right? You know, there's something about that mm -hmm. age thing. And, but, you know, Bonhoeffer said, the real problem with the Christian is this temptation to fly into fantasy. Mm -hmm. we, we love to create an imaginary world where yeah. everything works just the way we want it to. Yeah. When we pray, every prayer is answered. Right. When uh, people do wrong, they get punished. When they do right, they get rewarded. Everything's yep. <laughs> perfect in the imaginary world we create in our minds. Wow. And he said, the gospel is only the gospel because it works in the real world where mm. real people suffer in real ways. Mm -hmm. And good people aren't always rewarded That's and right. bad people aren't always punished. And, you know, Evangelical Christians create fantasy worlds that we occupy. Yeah. And in that fantasy world, Israel can do no wrong because it was ordained by God. He's the king of Israel. Everything's perfect there. Well, take another look at what's really going on there. Yeah. And you talk about human rights violations. There are plenty. And I remind my fellow white evangelicals you complain about Muslim countries, Israel has the same laws that prohibit you from preaching the gospel in Israel that Muslim countries have prohibiting you from preaching the gospel. You try preaching the gospel in Israel, you will be deported immediately. Right. You'll, you'll be ejected from the country. Yeah. Remember that. This yeah. is reality. That's Let's right. not build fantasies. That's right. That is such an excellent point to end on. I'm going to save our discussion. I think we talked about it a little bit in different ways about prosperity um, ministry versus humanitarian versus, you know, what Jesus really stood for. So before we end, I want to ask you, Rob, what is your prayer to God for our country? What do you, what do you pray for? In these days, I really pray that people will come to terms with reality. Look at ourselves, starting with ourselves. A real look at myself. I think I mentioned last time this Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who I've learned so much from uh, in his legacy, says, when we read the Bible, we read it against ourselves. It challenges me. That's right. It tells me that I have to change. There's change I have to make. So I think we start with ourselves, then with our communities, and, and we face who we really are and what we really are, and we name it. And then we begin to take steps to cure those failings and shortcomings. And if we can come to this place, I think we will be much better in the future. I, I tend to be an mm -hmm. optimist because mm -hmm. I look at the face of young people yeah. today. And, and I'm gonna tell you, I, I know we're over time, but it was when my daughter wept at the election of Barack Obama that mm -hmm. just started to shake my mm -hmm. foundations. Wow. So these, yeah. uh, I just pray we get more gifts like that. Oh, absolutely. And you have been a gift to me. I am so grateful. And I thank God. God is always up to something. And, you know, I said today in my car, I, I just, it, you know, it just, I said, God, you know, I see you. I see what you're doing. Because having you respond, this was so, so set up by God. And, and I know it was. And, and then reading 
um, your book, going through it. I think I'm making a, tr- a, a, a new conversion. I'm at a place to where I said I grew up very conservative, Pentecostal and um, preached that way for a long time. Um, but I'm God is doing something. And I'm so glad that you have a um, a blueprint for people like me who um, right now are on these pilgrimages. I just want to I just want to be where Jesus is and where he would be and do really what he would do that whole what would Jesus do? I, I that's where I am. I don't want all the other stuff that has come with the practice of my faith that I was taught in a lot of ways in a very conservative um, Pentecostal upbringing. So I thank you so much. I I am just so grateful that our, our paths crossed and God placed us in each other's lives. And, and I will have you back on the show. Thank you so much, my friend. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. This is a Savage Bull Entertainment production.